But how it came about was I was contacted and uh, I was asked to meet somebody one night. And I remember walking up and I saw the car and they opened the door and I got in, sat down. There was two guys in there. And then this conversation started. One of them, the guys I sort of vaguely knew, the other I didn't. And this conversation started and, uh, about this dolphin called Rocky, who was at uh, Morecambe Marine Land in Lancashire. Then he started to talk about uh, freeing this dolphin. And my first thoughts were, you've got to be kidding. Here I am sat in the middle of England, the furthest away from the sea we can get. And you're talking to me about trying to pull a dolphin out of a pond and put it back into this out of a pool and put it back into the sea. The idea was that we would build a stretcher, hopefully get him to come to us like he had been doing during our nightly visits, somehow get the net round him and hold him into the side, lift him out of the water onto the stretcher, open the doors from the inside at high tide, carry him down into the Morecambe Bay and hopefully away. <laughs> This is Mel Broughton, and this is My Friends Do the Coolish. Seems like you kind of started out at a pretty early age, like 15 years old. I think it's fair to say my case, I was, I was born that way. Even at a very early age, as a very young child, I was completely appalled by injustice and cruelty. As far back as I can remember, even as a very young child. Uh, I was also appalled by cruelty and injustice against people, even when I was very young. So my answer to why I got involved so early is, is that I, I don't ever remember not feeling any other way. For me, it, it was always there and always has been. It's never diminished. You know, I, I was 60 years old this weekend, just gone. Uh, I think I can, it's fairly safe to say, if I could say <laughs> absolutely, that I feel as strongly now at 60 as I did at six. So at 15, you did kind of like a, an Osprey? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was actually 16. I left school actually just before my 16th birthday. And um, I went up to Scotland straight away on my own. And, um, took part in a, um, a project to protect uh, the Ospreys, which had returned to nest in Scotland. And they were rare birds. And they had a 24-hour guard on the nest. Was it had been robbed several times by egg thieves who obviously made a lot of money out of it. And interestingly enough... Um, I was camped in some woods nearby and we had a, uh, a caravan where we used to have our breakfast and that was if we, if we came off watch. And I'll always remember sitting in there and a guy walked in with a Hunt Sab sweatshirt on and uh, we immediately struck up a conversation because I just straight away felt, oh, this is brilliant, you know. I, I think we're taught as we grow up not to speak up or not to challenge because it'll get you in trouble, you know. I, I remember that being something I was told a lot when I was at school and I never understood it. I still don't, you know. It was something that never took hold of me. Uh, I still, you know, always did and still do believe that you have to stand up, uh, even if there's a cost to it. Um, it's still, you know, something you should always be prepared to do. And and I'm, I'm assuming that probably came together in a lot of different ways throughout your life. But like, the one that I always, um, I love the story of is, is uh, the Rocky story. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> There doesn't seem to be a lot written or talked about in terms of that, but I, do, I just, the iconic photos of you all standing with the dolphin, uh, with Rocky next to that tank is something that is like, I don't know, it, it triggers a lot in me in terms of inspiration and thinking outside of the box and like just saying like, fuck yeah. it, let's try something really big and see if it works. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. So this is 1988 and how it, I mean, I live in, uh, I was living in Northampton at the time, the most landlocked county in England, so for the furthest sea you could possibly want to get, which is ironic, really. But how it came about was I was contacted and uh, I was asked to meet somebody one night. And I remember walking up and I saw the car and they opened the door and I got in, sat down. There was two guys in there. And then this conversation started. One of them, the guys I sort of vaguely knew, the other I didn't. And this conversation started and, uh, about this dolphin called Rocky, who was at uh, Morecambe Marine Land in Lancashire. Then he started to talk about uh, freeing this dolphin. And my first thoughts were, you've got to be kidding. Here I am sat in the middle of England, the furthest away from the sea we can get. And you're talking to me about trying to pull a dolphin out of a pond and put it back into this, out of a pool and put it back into the sea. He produced a, a cardboard tube and pulled out some very, very detailed charts of uh, Morecambe Bay, which was right next to Morecambe Marine Land, where Rocky was currently incar uh, incarcerated at that time. And then he started to talk about uh, the tides and the fact, as I looked at the charts, he pointed out that there were deep channels that run out the bay 
and at high tide, a dolphin could make its way out into the open sea. And at that point, I started to think, maybe this isn't so crazy. But he told me that Rocky had been there a long time and that basically he was going mad from the uh, effects of const- you know, the incarceration. And he said well, it was a very small pool and performing tricks every day for tourists. I said, I've got to talk to some people. I'm going to go up there and have a look and we'll see. And I was still at that point, remember, walking away and thinking, this is crazy. <laughs> this really is crazy. But there was something in me that was thinking, it's crazy, but it's got my interest. The next thing I did was I travelled up to Morgan and walked up to uh, the jetty. There's a small jetty that went out, that sort of stuck out almost into the sea. And on that jetty was this place called Morecambe Marineland. And I, I walked into the foyer a bit, paid my money. I then went through, I looked down from the wooden benches. Uh, there's people, like, pe- people sat either side of me and uh, it sort of went up like a small grandstand. I was horrified. And I looked at the pool and I thought, that is tiny. The pool was tiny. And then I saw Rocky for the first time. The performance began and I sat there along with everybody else and he's jumping through hoops, knocking a ball. Because it was such a small ball, I mean, every time he jumped out, I just thought he's going to come on, he's going to hit the concrete, he's going to land on the side, you know, it it was that small. So I looked at the people either side of me, clapping and cheering, you know, children and their parents. And I thought, at that moment, I thought, no, I'm doing it. I'm going to give this a go. That was it. It took me a couple of minutes. I don't care. I'm going away. I'm going to recruit some people. I'm going to give this a shot. What followed was I approached a few people, chatted to them. Their original response was, you're crazy. And then I took, talked to them a bit more. And we all, I said, I'll take you up there. We'll all go up. So we returned again. They saw what I saw and they said, yeah, we're going to go. We're going to try this. This is another thing that Matt realised how awful it was for Rocky, is that at high tide, uh, his pool was only a few metres from the open sea, although he was surrounded by a wall and a stand. So I always believed that he knew, that Rocky knew he was only literally a few metres from the wild. If we could get him out of the water onto a stretcher and back through at high tide, we could do it. So we went away. We did a lot of research about dolphins. We learned as much as we could about their behaviour, what they needed. Everything we could get hold of, basically, we looked at. He was a big animal. I think he weighed about 650 pounds. He was about nine foot long. He was a big, big bottlenose dolphin. But we also had to get his trust. And this is where we made some quite interesting nighttime visits. So we would return to Morecambe quite regularly over the following few months. Uh, Late at night, in the early hours of the morning, I would climb in over the wall into the dolphinarium, open the door from the inside and let the other people in. And then we would try and get to know him. Um, We sit by the pool, we clap our hands and he'd come up to us, uh, we'd touch him a bit. But we were a bit wary about doing it too much, over-familiarising, but at the same time we needed to get his trust if we were going to try and get him onto a stretcher and out. And then one night, a couple of us stripped down and jumped in the pool with him. So it's about two o'clock in the morning by now. <laughs> and we got in the pool and had to swim around with him. That went okay. And the, the plan was, uh, what we found inside the Dolphin Air on one of our nightly night visits was um a large net that that they'd obviously used to catch him maybe when they cleaned the pool which to be honest didn't look very often the idea was that we would build a stretcher hopefully get him to come to us like he had been doing during our nightly visits somehow get the net round him and hold him into the side lift him out the water onto the stretcher open the doors from the inside high tide carry him down into the Morecambe Bay and hopefully away Next thing was to make the stretcher and see if it worked. And we purchased two scaffold poles and some very, very, it was kind of like a canvas stretcher type material. We made a stretcher and we had the holes cut and foam padded where the flippers would go through and everything. We had to know whether we could first carry him, whether it was carry his weight. So we estimated his weight at somewhere around, I said, 650 pounds, 650 pounds. So well, how are we going to do this? And we said, well, how about bags of cement? So off we went to the local DIY store and bought... <laughs> bags of cement uh laid them on the stretcher we picked it up it was heavy but it stood it the stretcher stood it we walked with it the distance we needed to do we, we could do it we could physically do it so it was on we had our charts we looked at the tides and we picked this particular night we hired a car the net was already in the dolphin area it was the stretcher went in the car the other equipment we needed went in and off we set we arrived in Morecambe that night probably around midnight 
walked down the jetty, I climbed over the wall, opened the doors from the inside, let everyone in. Got the net out, got the stretcher by the pool, and Rocky wasn't having it. He just wasn't having it. We got him to the side, we couldn't get him to stay there. We tried to get the net under, but he just wouldn't cooperate. So this went on for, I think it's probably two hours. We tried and tried. And at that point, unbeknownst to us, uh, a night worker at the hotel had just happened to look out the window at the moment uh, I was going to walk back and uh, let everyone out and had called the police. But we weren't aware of this at that point. So we said, look, we weren't going to give up. We'll put everything back as we found it. We'll go back, we'll rethink, and we'll give it a second shot. We were ready to come back. But obviously, <laughs> the call had already been made. I let everyone out. As we were, I was climbing back out myself, I saw blue flashing lights just coming along the uh, seafront road. And I realized that something was wrong. So we just ran in different directions, basically. Unfortunately, obviously, we had a stretcher and all the other equipment there, which we had to just leave in the car park. The police did indeed come screeching to a halt. Police officers ran out everywhere. I got away. We all got away at first. Um, I dived under a car, rolled under a car in the hotel car park. <laughs> <laughs> thinking well if i lie here long enough and quietly enough they're going to go away but they didn't the next thing i could hear was footsteps coming and a light being shone under all the cars and thought well if i lie here for too much longer i'm going to get caught anyway i better make a break for it so i <laughs> rolled out from under the car right in front of a police officer <laughs> <laughs> I ran. I ran straight across the road in front of the hotel. I ran into the car park there. I could hear like police officers behind me. They weren't far behind me. I ran to the rear of the car park to be, con to be confronted by a um, rather large wall. <laughs> Realising I couldn't turn back and get back out, I did my best to do a, a sort of high jump <laughs> to try and get to the top of the wall, which I didn't quite make. <laughs> Slid down straight into the arms of the police officers. <laughs> Uh, I was duly arrested. I was put in the back of a van, and within a few minutes, I was joined by three of my friends who had also been picked up at various points along the seafront. This is interesting. This it probably goes some way to explain why we are animal rights people. We weren't charged with trying to steal a dolphin. What we were charged with was attempted theft of property, and they valued him at that time. This is 1988. He was valued at, I think it was 20 some thousand pounds. So they didn't, even, they didn't even call him a dolphin. They just said property belonging to. It immediately struck me straight away. As, uh, you know, this is exactly what this is about. It hit the press and it made the front pages of some of the press, basically because everyone thought it was insane. You know, these guys have been arrested for trying to steal a dolphin or as we prefer to say, liberate a dolphin. My co-defendants, one of them died recently, actually, he was an American uh, called Jim Buckner. He was an ex-American Air Force guy. He was a... Uh, Vietnam veteran. Uh, the other one was a guy who was a psychologist, uh, Jim O'Donnell. Uh, of course, my other co-defendant was Barry Horn. He was late to die on hunger strike, protesting against the uh, UK's government's policy on animal experimentation. Pretty much from the start, we decided that we were going to plead that it was a justified action. We were guilty of trying to steal the dog and we had good just reasons for doing that. We, I remember in the courtroom, we all stood in the, the dock the evidence or the exhibits were there for the jury to see, which included a, a, a stretcher <laughs> so <we started laughs> in the court that had uh, been designed to carry a dolphin, uh, the net that we tried to put him in, and other associated stuff that they'd found. Uh, and the trial began, and it was an interesting trial because arguments were put forward about what happens to these animals in captivity, this, the psychological and physical damage they, they suffer which is well documented now. And that's how we ran the case, that we had every good reason to liberate him. Every good reason. Unfortunately for us, the judge certainly didn't like us. Um, <laughs> I think They never do, huh? <laughs> they never do, no. Um, we were found guilty by the jury. Myself and Barry were given suspended prison sentences and quite heavy fines. The other two gyms received fines. What followed was unbelievable. It was a pressure was campaign, yeah, against the... the that was an doctor. amazing pressure campaign, yeah. And I, I took part in that as much as I could. Um, a friend of mine who was actually at Lancaster University at the time, she immediately started a free Rocky campaign. What they did is they organised pickets at every performance, every single one. They started off picketing outside with a megaphone during every performance, and slowly but surely, people were turning away. In fact, in the mm -hmm. end, I think it's fair to say they were probably turning away 70% of the people. There were meetings held with the local council. The media were, were really on it. We had a national march for Rocky in Morecambe. Well over a thousand people marched around there for him. All kinds of stuff started to happen. And the campaign built and built. The 
uh, Morecambe was clearly now struggling. The local council dug their heels in because basically, at first, their main interest was um, an economic one that the, the dolphin shows brought tourists, you know. But that was never really true, we didn't feel. Um, it was just a small part of it. But eventually, they relented as well. Uh, there were one or two councillors who actually believed we were right. You know, minds were changed. But there was also a lot of other stuff going on, which wasn't so pleasant um, from the owners of Rocky, which involved some quite underhanded stuff against individuals in the campaign. What happened that probably finally finishes off was um, the Born Free Foundation got involved. They carried a lot of clout and ultimately it led to negotiations and uh, the owners of Rocky uh, agreed to hand him over. That still wasn't the end. Um, in fact, there was another real twist to it. The Born Free Foundation, along with uh, a national newspaper in the UK, uh, ran a campaign for Rocky. And in fact, they raised, I think it was about £50,000. Hmm. British Airways agreed to fly him free of charge to the um, Turks and Caicos Islands, where a pre-release pen was waiting for him and he could be rehabilitated and released back into the wild. So the deal was done. And just before, uh, in fact, it was only the day before, the owners of Rocky quietly put him on a low loader and hit moved him away in the middle of the night and they moved him not too far away to yorkshire to a place called flamingo land which was also a dolphinarium owned by a man called peter bloom now peter bloom was a very unpleasant character and he was the one who had basically tried through some pretty underhand tactics to destroy not just the campaign but some individuals in it but they secretly moved him away just before he was about to be picked up mm. we got a call saying look he's He's been, uh, he's been moved up to Flamingo Land. The flight was waiting for Rocky at Manchester Airport to take him away. So we just put the call out to go up there. And I think it was a Saturday night. We all just drove up there. People, as many people as we could get drove up there, up to Flamingo Land. Uh, the vet from Bourne Free was on his way to go into past Rocky Fit to travel. So we went up to Flamingo Land. And I remember arriving there. But the press were there, national press were there. But as we got, as we pulled up at the front, we were met by some very big men who had clearly been drinking quite heavily and had obviously been paid to uh, deal with us. And they attempted to deal with us. And in fact, there was a fight, but we forced our way in. We forced our, and in fact, there are pictures on the front page of some of the national newspapers of, 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 it, of it happening. It was unbelievable. Huh. But eventually we, we forced our way in and the vet came in and the low loader, the lorry was on its way. Rocky was passed fit by the vet to travel. He was loaded on the lorry and, and driven to Manchester Airport my friend who ran the campaign, she was one of the team that was going to fly with him, along with a guy from the British Marine Life Rescue, the vet, and a representative from the Born Free Foundation who would be in the hold with Rocky to keep him. Obviously, he had to be uh, covered in tarpaulins, kept moist, and the vet had to check him throughout the flight. But they, they eventually landed in the uh, Turks and Caicos Islands. Rocky was you know, unloaded checked again by the vet and everything and eventually taken to a it was basically a pen that was in the sea so this is where they would put him in this pet and he would acclimatize themselves now it was known that there were dolphins already living in the area a tourist who went there would swim them and everything in fact there's one well-known dolphin called jojo who, who had been there for some years so eventually rocky was put into this pen and um i remember getting a phone call from my friend from the turks and caicos islands about uh, two days later or something she rang me up and said, Mel, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? He's jumped out of the pen. <laughs> so he decided or he'd made his own mind up. Of course, all the uh, dolphin experts back here were saying he'll die, he'd be dead. And for years and years after, Rocky was seen with Jojo, happily living it up around the Turks and Caicos Islands. He proved everyone wrong. Proved yeah. absolutely everyone wrong. And he wasn't going to wait for the release program. He'd able to decide he just jumped out. Uh, I saw a picture of the pen and it, uh, it, it kind of, it was in the water and it was, it was a few feet clear of the water. So it wasn't a mean feat on his part to think, right, I'm off. He had been in training for, for 20 years for that jump. Yeah. <laughs> for that jump, exactly. So anyone ever says to me, animals don't know what freedom is. I'll tell you, yeah, they do. They know exactly what it is. You must think of like Rocky sitting in that pen at the Dolphinarium for 20 something years and just thinking, I know that this ocean is right you know, a few meters away, like, and he finally got a chance to make that jump. I, I always said he knew that he knew he was only a few meters from the sea when he was yeah. in the pen. And like you say, when he got that chance, I said, I'm not waiting any longer. That was it. But he hung around the islands for years and he was a regular, he was, he was sighted regularly. So he, he obviously went on to uh, 
build a good life in the wild with his friends, you know. And um, and and I suppose the next stage of the story is even more remarkable in a way is that, you know, on returning to the UK, campaigns sprung up everywhere, uh, Brighton Dolphin area, Flamingo Land, and one after the other they fell. Morecambe shut down, the Marine Land shut down, and then the campaign started against the others, and they just fell one after the other. They all fell, and there are none now. And now there are no dolphinariums or dolphins in captivity in the UK. If I'm not mistaken, like you just finished up a, a, another prison sentence, yeah, 10, 10 years, is that right? Yeah. So I'm sure there's probably a very interesting story there as well. But um, but I'm wondering, like, you know, this is not your, your first time uh, incarcerated. Um, you've been doing this stuff, you know, since the early 80s, if I'm not mistaken. All sorts of, you know... Uh, liberation stuff, direct action stuff, campaign work, educational outreach. And I imagine at some point it starts to feel like, yeah, what, what is, what are we doing here? Like, but like, what is it that gives you that hope to come out of prison, uh, you know, a, a, another prison sentence after multiple years and be like, I'm ready to go. Part of it is to do, to do what I said right at the very beginning. Uh, I was born that way and that's not going to change. I've always believed and I still believe absolutely that it's not just a liberation struggle it's a political and social justice issue as much as it is anything else and the thing that gives me hope is that i don't think this injustice can survive ultimately for us as a movement questions are always difficult about where we focus and, and where we invest our, our resources you know both human and, and financial and everything else into into to winning this uh i think in my finality i always have also believed in the grassroots of the movement i think without that we we, we go nowhere the most amazing people I've ever met have been in the grassroots animal rights movement. People who thought outside the box, acted outside the box, and created the possibility for change. As long as those people exist, then we will win. Mm-hmm.